Assalamu alaikum everyone, this is Brother Abdul Malik, as you know, Barakat's DVD Magazine Volume 3, we're in Philadelphia, PA. This is the M2M story, a convert story, a Muslim story, recorded in history. I remember when I first took my shahada Used to go to Central Masfil and Quran and Sunnah And every Friday afternoon we gone to Juma. One Friday me get a jokes from a Arab brother Two before me come to dinner I used to be a gangster Me decide me I go fool the boy up with kappa As big up for me can move a man touch me shoulder Man me get fit under Assalamu alaikum everyone as you know It's Brother Abdul Malik Barakat DVD Volume 3 We out here in West Philly you know, just doing it up. We're in Masjid Mahajadeen. And we just, you know, having to witness the young brothers here, you know, just studying. You know, this is beautiful. The youth doing their thing. So, you know, we're going to go over here, you know, and ask, you know, listen in on, on what they're doing. And that's. No, who knows that I do? <coughs> Alright, well, uh, I'm proud of this companion sitting down. A man came out the desert with extremely white food. He had extremely black hair, and he came to the companions, and he asked them, what is Islam? And they explained to him that it is to take care, to, to declare there's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger, to, uh, to make salat, <clears throat> to give zakat, to fast in my Ramadan, and to make hajj at least once in your lifetime. Then the man asked them, what is Iman? And... The brother that was the angel replied to belief in the law, the belief in his angels, the belief in his books, the belief in his prophets, the belief in the hereafter, and and the belief of divine decree, which is the cutter. And the man asked him, "What is insane?" And the and the companions asked him, and the companions answered them. And he said that it's to pray as if the law is in front of you. So after the man left, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked his companions, do y'all know who that man was? And they was like, Allah and his messenger know best. And the man replied, and the Prophet replied, my fault, that that was the angel Jibril coming to teach you about your religion. So it's important to know your religion. That's why we're sitting here, you know, answering questions to make sure that we all up on our game. Who was the prophet's uncle? That when the when the Meccans were persecuting the Muslims at the time, who stood up and stood by his uncle and by his nephew, who was the prophet, and said, "If y'all want to fight Muhammad, y'all gotta see me." And he took a shahada right there on the spot, and everybody rolled, scattered. Who was that? Read. Yeah, he got air flows with it. He got air flows in his hair. No, Rashid. It was, uh, it was Hamza's uncle. Yeah. Alright, well, which one of the Prophet Muhammad's uncles was talked about in the Quran and he's promised hell? Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab. Right. What'd you say? Rasul, you know that sword? Sword Lahab? You know what Saeed? No, you know what other reap? I know. Oh, I know some of it. You know it? I don't know my name, but I might know it. Tibet, you're there. That's it right there, you know that? I know it. No, you know it? Yes. Hold on, you know it? 
This is the M2M story, a convert story. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiru. Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyaati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu falamudillala, wa man yudlil falamudillala. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallahu wa ahduhu la sharika la. Wa ashadu anna muhammadin abduhu wa rasooluhu sallam tasliman kathira amma ba'd. فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم ما بعد. As you all know, this is what we open up with, which is what that which the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم used to open up with, which is خطبة الحاجة. And he used to start off with this in all of his sittings as well as the khutbahs that he gave as well as when he opened up for a marriage. So it's very important of course for us to open up with this when we're dealing with the topic of marriage. And it, uh, in translation is, all praise is due to Allah. We praise him and we seek his assistance and we, and we seek his help. Whoever Allah guides, then there's no one who can lead him astray. And whoever is left astray, then there's no one who can guide him. And we bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except for Allah. He is one and he has no partners. And that Muhammad وسلم, is his slave and messenger. After that, then know that the best speech is the book of Allah. And the best guidance is the guidance of the messenger وسلم, And the worst of matters are newly invented matters. For every newly invented matter is an innovation. And every innovation is astray. And every astray is in the hellfire. Continuing on, we're dealing with a topic that we know is a topic uh, of some controversy uh, amongst those outside of Islam, and inshallah inside of Islam is not. For verily we know, as we deal in Islam, we know that there is nothing that Allah has given us halal, except that it is good. And there is nothing that he has told us is haram, except that we stay far away, th away from it because in it is evil. So what doesn't change in the situation of zawaj or marriage? Nor does it change in the adad of zawaj or the situation of plural marriage. So regarding the situation of plural marriage, Allah Jalla has told us in the Quran, in Surah Al-Nisa, when He says, "Wa in khiftum alla taadilu, wa in khiftum alla tuqasitu fi al-yatam, fankihu ma qabalakum min al-nisa imathna wa thulatha wa ubaa." فإن خفتم ألا تعدلوا فواحدة أو ما ملكت أيمانكم ذلك أدنى ألا تعولوا. In the beginning of Surah An-Nisa, for those who know and are familiar with it, I'm sure all of us, he talks about the issue of plural marriage. But there's a few interesting points that we need to bring out of this ayah. Number one, he says that if you are unable to be just regarding the yatama or the orphans, then marry. From the woman, two, three, or four. But if you are unable to be just with them, then marry one or a right hand possession. This is better so that you don't transgress any bounds. The ulama extract from this the first point 
is that we know the tartib of the way that Allah Jalla wa Ala does things in the Quran. When He lists things, He's He's listing them either from that which is best and most important and better to Him to least important or vice versa. So in this situation, He says, "Marry two, three, or four." And this is not my statement. I'm sorry. I should I should stop here and say, "In the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, not Idris." In the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, and also in the explanation from Al Qurtubi and from all of the other tafsir, they agree on one point, which is that Allah Jalla wa Ala talks about this from that which is most pleasing to Him to that which is least pleasing to Him. So He says, first, marry two, three, or four. And if you are unable to do that because of a deficiency within yourself, talking to the men. Then, because of that deficiency, then only take one. And if you have a deficiency even to that extent, excuse me, to that extent, then take the right hand possession. So no one in their good frame of mind would say that taking the right hand possession is first and is best. So we know by that that taking two, three, or four is best, and the right hand possession is least. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to the Tahira Show. We would like to thank Imam Idris Abdullah for breaking down the responsibilities and the duties of both the wife and husband and polygamy. And inshallah, we hope the information that he gave us made, made it clear for those in the audience and for those who are viewing the show. Our first guest is Sister Mecca. Sister Mecca is um, a sister who is already in a marriage and she's actually looking for a second wife for her husband. So we want to hear her story and get into her mind, inshallah. So please welcome Sister Mecca to the show. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, Sister Mecca, how are you? I'm doing good, alhamdulillah. Thank you for being a guest to the show. Thank you for having me. Yes, yes. So, you know, I just want to get to the first question because when, when I was introduced to you and I realized that sister was looking for a second, like for her husband, my first reaction was, oh my goodness, like what is she thinking? You know, like many other people may think. So what is your reasons behind looking for a wife for your husband? Well, I've been married to my husband for 10 years, going on 11 years, inshallah, this year, mm -hmm. in July. And um, one thing that I, we always kind of talked on was polygamy. It was something that um, it was basically he comes from a polygamist family yeah. and I kind of had a feeling or had an idea that that could be a possibility with him so I took it upon myself to get more information study on it and to see you know basically to get kind of like a comfortability with it because even though I saw his family how they were yeah. and how it worked I still needed to work on a few things as far as within myself and just to get that comfortability yeah. and mashallah um Basically, it came time sometime late last year when uh, we decided, well, we kind of came to the conclusion that I was going to be going overseas, inshallah, to study. And I automatically said, well, it's time to look for a second wife. Yes. Automatically. You know, especially being a daughter, I was going over for some time, like for like a year, for 12 months. And um, it was funny because when I said that, I actually felt the comfort. I, I actually felt comfortable in my heart in saying it. It actually like eased off my tongue. Why, why is that? Why is that? I, you know what? Because I really think throughout the whole process of me not only researching, mm -hmm. not just with reading books, but with also with people that I know who have successful polygamous marriages. Yes. And then on top of that, making do I have for my own self. I think, mashallah, Allah gave me the opportunity of placing that, at least that, that, that next stage or that next level of being comfortable within my own heart, being as though that this is something that I not only want from my husband, but I truly, honestly want for another sister who is looking for a good husband to marry, inshallah. Well, thank you, Sister Mecca. Um, we're, going to, we're going to bring you back towards the end of the show for a question and answer section, because I may have my answers asked some questions that sisters may have on their mind. Um, so inshallah, we look forward to having you back. We're gonna take a break and we'll be right back.
Reservations have been made I stay ready All players when you're marked It's gon' get heavy You get no end But you were waiting for it This is Global Training Center Where we service the community The fine threads of clothes Women and men We have suits from Italy 100% virgin wool, super 140s, wear it year round. We have nice woman apparel, garments, t shirts, stylish skirts, and blouses, and beautiful colors. And if need to be, if you have business for your service, we have the Internet Cafe. Our store is designed to service the global community. That's why we call it the Global Trading Center. Thank you for being a guest on the show. Thank you for having me. Yes. Um, Sister Khadija, my first question is, why did you choose to get into polygamous marriage? Okay. Um, I've been married before and I have two children. Um, and just a few reasons why I chose actually to look for a situation where I would be in a polygamous marriage. But I think one of the main reasons was, um, as the brother mentioned and people also mentioned, you know, some males are not ready for certain responsibilities. Mm -hmm. It's my opinion that when you're in, when you get into a polygamous situation, you're able to evaluate that man already in yeah. a family setting, evaluate how they deal with children, how they deal with responsibilities, how they deal with a number of different issues. So you already have that framework there to be able to evaluate them as a potential spouse. So I saw that as a huge benefit. Yes. Um, also, I'm kind of busy. <laughs> so I'm like, like a All that you, cooking, do, right? you do have sometimes have some time for yourself. Like I said, I have children. I have two children. Okay. So I wanted to make sure that I still had time for them. Okay. You know, to do the things that we do together, to do the outings with them. So that would afford us the time to continue to build our bond okay. as well. Okay. Um, so how was your marriage introduced? Like how was it introduced to you? Um, actually, my father called me and said, come over Sunday, there's a brother I want you to meet. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, but, you know, I'm that. He actually, our family has known the brother for a long time. Okay. Um, so it was someone that he knew and someone that, you know, he felt comfortable with. Um, and he brought him up as an option. So okay. That's how I, was introduced. I do appreciate you sharing your experience and the knowledge that you had. And again, we're going to bring you back towards the end of the show. We're going to have a question and answer section. So we'll all get a chance to, you know, speak with Sister Khadija. So thank you so much for being part of the show. We'll be right back. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum everyone, I'm Brother Abdul Malik. Assalamu alaikum, this is Brother Rashid Hafiz. And we're Righteous Minds Enterprises. We just want to send a warm, heartfelt thank you to Brother Ira and the brothers and sisters at uh, uh, the Muslim Journal. And especially for including us in the first issue of this section that is mostly uh, based for the youth and young adults. Yes, we are definitely striving to be you know, the ones who are bringing 
you know, warm, family-oriented entertainment to the Muslim community. And with that being said, make sure you always cop your barricades and get the Muslim Journal. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to the Tahira Show. Our next guest is Sister Rashida. Sister Rashida was once in a polygamous marriage and she is now divorced. So she's going to share her story, her experience, and her knowledge um, in her marriage. And I chose her last for a reason. She already has like the living experience. She's been in a marriage for some my years, so she's going to share share some light for us on this. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Rashida. Wa alaikum, Welcome to the show. Shukran. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Welcome to the show, and thank you so much for being a part of the show. So, my first question to you, Sister Rashida, how was you introduced to your polygamous marriage at the time? Well, um, I had been um, divorced um, from my children's father for almost five years, mm -hmm. and I actually was very content with my life. My children are young adults. I was in school, I was teaching classes, and working and organizing um, public health, and so I really had settled into a kind of a quiet, contented life. Yes. Um, and the brother approached me. Yes. And um, at first, uh, I actually laughed, you know, I was like, hey, marry me, sure. <laughs> Why? Um, well, because, um, well, first of all, he was younger. Okay. And so, you know, I thought, you, you have not a clue about, you know, what all this will be about. But um, the brother was very persistent. And actually, when he brought his reasons, um, you know, I had to give a consideration. And they really had to do with my knowledge. I'm known to be a student of Islam. Um, I try very hard to implement the deen because I teach the new shahadas and, you know, the young mm. sisters who are learning about Islam. Yes. And I really try as best I can to be um, a good example, yes. you know, for the sisters. And so he felt that it would add benefit to his marriage. Um, he had not young children, but they were approaching um, preteen, yes. and that um, he thought it would be beneficial to have someone of knowledge, as he would say, okay. you know, I'm available for his family. Um, he also said that because so many people think that because a sister, you know, has a good job, is well educated, um, if she's even if she's single, she doesn't really need anything. Right. And um, that's the Western mentality. Absolutely. So one of the things that was very interesting. <laughs> when my sister, who is not Muslim, um, asked him, you know, do you know, like, do you know who my sister is? And he was like, yeah, I know all of her accomplishments and that sort of thing, he said, but actually she's just a woman, mm -hmm. and she really needs to be with someone. She needs to be under the protection of someone. So he got her right away. Right. You know, she was like, you married that brother. Right. You know, how did he lie? And, you know, so I did, I did consider it, and, um, and I agreed. Okay, so he knew his duty and responsibility <coughs> as a Muslim man. Yes, he did espouse his understanding of it. Um, and I had some, I had some very specific um, ideas about what, how I wanted it to go. Okay. Um, and among them was that I wanted to um, meet with my hopeful co-op. Yes. And and really talk with her. I wanted her to, you know, know, you know, what kind of person I, I was, and so. I made uh, an appointment okay. for dinner with her. That's great. You know, it does a business. Yeah, and, and really, you know, try to talk with her. Yes. You know about it. So okay. I, I had a plan. Okay. All right. Um, what were some of your challenges coming into the marriage? Um, I'm. I would say probably the most the most challenging probably was helping uh, my co-wife come to a level of comfortability yeah. um, with me. Um, I think, you know, in all honesty, even though as sisters, 
You know, we say we want for our sisters what we want for ourselves. Um, I think as, you know, Sister Khadija was saying earlier, the, there's challenges around ownership. Yeah. You know, is my husband belongs to me, mm -hmm. um, rather than giving a really clear thought about it, and he belongs to our law. Yeah. And that our duty, as the Imam said, you know, is to bring that balance, that protection, that partnership to him. And so for me, trying to get to the place where we were truly sisters was like a mission. Yes. And so I think that was the most challenging. And we made it. I mean, yes. when people see us even today, though we are both divorced from the brother, yes. um, we still are really, really close. And yes. we, we were laughing just a week ago about how much we love each other, wow. you know. But it, I mean, by no means is it um, an easy task, but if you are actually putting your your hope, your fears, your concerns in the hands of Allah Ta'ala, and you follow what you're supposed to do as a Muslimah, it unfolds in yes. that way, you know. So um, why do you feel it's, more of a challenge for the first wife to take on a co-wife? I think, you know, as a part of Western society, the, as I was saying, the idea of ownership, um, the, the level of jealousy that gets out of control, um, and even in our sisterhood, her friends, you know, coming, you know, a girl, Wasn't that I can't you believe that this girl is going to do this to you, da 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 da, you yes. know, that kind of thing, I think, adds to her anxiety of being discarded or, or set back yes. or cast aside yes. because of, you know, the additional wife. Yes. Um, but I think, again, one of the things that becomes really important is also how we approach it as sisters. I think that it is devastating when a sister has not met her co-wife before yeah. the marriage. Yes. Um, I, I know the brothers sometimes say, you know, well, you know, I don't have to get the approval or, or whatever, but this is your family. Yes. And so that's one of the reasons why for me it was really important for her to know I was coming, not to hear it, yeah. you know, through the grapevine yes. or anything like, well, yeah, you know, we got married last Friday. It's a painful thing. It's very do. painful because you, you can't help but feel like you've been thrown away. Right. So I think it is really hard for the first wife sometimes right. if they don't have the opportunity to at least be informed. It's not a matter of permission, but it, it's, it's, an, it's an informing, it's an establishment of a relationship because you're, his, you're the co-wife, but you also her sister. Right. right? And you should want that to be at least as friendly a relationship as possible, the idea of respect. And so for me, it was respectful to come, you know, and, and sit with her and talk to her about myself and what things I could offer her. Okay. Um, because as if she was some younger, she's not a lot younger, but she's younger <laughs> than I am, but she was still raising children. Right. As I say, they were preteens. I'd already gone through all the adolescent shenanigans that you know children can put forth to you. Um, I also know that when you're in your mid-30s yes. and you're married, that's the very time marriage becomes most challenging if you have children, your sister's trying to run her household, she's trying to raise children. Um, she may not be as attentive to her husband because he's off door work and she's trying to keep everything you know manageable. So as I said to her, the children can come with me, you wow. know, we can trade off, you know, so that even if it's, you know, it's your weekend, as it were, they can come and go to the movies with me, right. you know, because there's nobody in my house right. but me. And so, you know, really being able to, to offer that. Um, and then a willingness to share where there are concerns. Um, she was concerned, for example, um, when we first got married, that he would not be able to spend as much time with the children and doing their homework and you know sort of those kind of supportive things yes. that she wanted and uh, she actually came up with the day's rotation okay now initially he, he and I had a had agreed on what the rotation was going to be yeah and it's like and that's the way right. the rotation is going to be right <laughs> but a lot didn't have it planned that way yeah <laughs> and so she actually came up with a much better okay. rotation but what brought us together on it was we both recognized that it was wearing him out, that every other night and never actually um, settling down in one household before it was time to get to another. Mm -hmm. And so really taking into consideration, um, we, we want him to be happy, we want him to rest. Yes. And so she came up with a really great you know, two days, okay. two days and every other weekend. Yes. And I mean, it made it really good for us. Once, you know, once I sort of settled down with the idea myself, I was like, you know, actually, this can I work. Can I can do with that. And then yeah. we started thinking, well, what about 
special days. You know, for example, it's your anniversary, but it's my weekend. Yeah, how would you work that out? What, we're sisters. Okay. We trade off. Okay. So, okay, you, I got Friday of your weekend, but you get Saturday, Sunday, and you can have my Monday. Okay. You know what I mean? Or if uh, it's his birthday, should we, we don't celebrate birthdays in a big way, but we're all one family. So, right. are we going to have a, a, a family gathering? So, uh, yes, we can all come together at your house. Okay. And, and we'll have cake and, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, we tried to work out how we were going to do it. And I remember the first Eid that we were all together. Yes, I like the story. And the community was like, oh, are, they, <laughs> are they together? Like, right. Wow, they're walking into the front. We, we were like, okay, we're going to eat. That's are we ready? Right. You know, and yes. we walked in the I saw they come in. My salam. <laughs> everybody's waiting for something to break yes. out. Yes. But it, but it didn't, you know. Right. Um, and I would say, I think our, really, our biggest challenge, I mean, we had, we had issues, we have different households. I have, I have a quiet house, yes. and there's no children tearing up the furniture. And, right. So my household was different. It was, it was more peaceful, yeah. as it were, compared to a household where you had two yeah. adolescents running around, and there's toys and furniture everywhere, and things are, mm -hmm. it wasn't like that. So our households were different. So we had to come to terms with what that might mean, and that's why I always offer, you know, if you want to send the, the young people over, I've got mm -hmm. videos and mm -hmm. things that my sons, you know, had, and they, they'll be entertained, and yes. give you all some opportunity to sort of restore some, you know, yeah. romance and yeah. wine and dine kind That's of thing, important. you know, and that, you know, <laughs> but in that venue to really, you know, to really make a, a different kind of life. And as I say, although, you know, we both ultimately were divorced by him, it left us with a sisterhood that it, there's just nothing that can break right. it. You right. know, it's, it's really good. I love my sister. That's good, and I think that's how it should be. Like, if you're going to get into polygamous marriage, you should have that sisterhood, that friendship, and don't dispute or bicker among one, one another. Yeah, we're, we're, you know, I mean, it's not ideal. We have to keep it real. There were days where, you know, maybe I did something I didn't recognize as being you know, offensive, and she would be, you know, a little put off with me, yes. but she said it. Yes. She said, I'm really, I'm really peeved at you. You know, <laughs> it hurts. It really did. Well, well, we have to wrap it up <laughs> due to time, but we do appreciate you sharing your story with us, your experience, and inshallah, we hope her information and her experience benefit not only the citizens in the audience, but those who are viewing the show. So we'll be back. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Welcome back to the Tahira Show. Right now, we're going to take some questions from the audience, and I have a sister, Aaliyah Kabir, who actually, before we get to her, she actually helped us put the show on. And without permission of Allah, if it wasn't for her assistance, we wouldn't have had the outcome that we had today. So we really, like, I really want to recognize you, and I really appreciate from the bottom of my heart what you have done for the show. Assalamu alaikum. Well, As Tahira said, my name is Aliyah Kabir. I'm a member here at United Muslim Masjid here in Philadelphia, and I have a few questions from the audience. The first question is, how do you, or how did you in some cases, um, prepare your family, both Muslim and non-Muslim, for your entry as a co-wife or the acceptance of a co-wife. So basically the question is, how'd you tell your folk <laughs> that you was really gonna do this? <laughs> Who wanna take this question? Well, I guess I can say okay. I, I actually had to do a lot of uh, preparation. Um, I sat my family down as soon as I had made my final decision um, and talked about what polygyny in Islam was, you know, the fact that we can um, be more than one wife. Yes. Um, they were stunned, um, <laughs> but like many, but they were stunned when I took Shahada 28 years ago, so it was like not new. And, and so, they, you know, they were 
curious, and my mom especially was like, are you sure, mm -hmm. you know, you can do this? And then I told her, well, let's think about it, you know, I'm, I'm going to be gone half the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's, it's going to be different, but, you know, I think it'll be all right. And she was worried, um, you know, she was very worried about it, whether it was something that was really possible to do. Because my family is Christian. Okay. I have remained outside of my children. I'm the only Muslim in my family. And so everything I do is under scrutiny anyway. Yes. <laughs> but they were really very good. My sister already knew since she was she interviewed him yeah. to be sure that everything was going to be all right. And so that was kind of interesting. But um, she she thought it was going to be OK. She said, well, you know, you're always doing something we don't expect. So, <laughs> you know. Thank you. Thank you. We can go to the next question. Knowing that your husband belongs to Allah first and then to you, how do you handle the balance or non-balance of his affection as being a co-wife? Okay. Interesting question. We go, I guess you all can tackle that in a quick one minute. Feel comfortable? Sure. Um, <clears throat> if anything, um, I feel as though that, like, being as though that he, of course, like you said, he belongs to Allah. But you, sometimes we have to kind of take ourselves out of being selfish yes. and, you know, wanting him and his affection and his love all to ourselves. And we kind of kind of see how not only is this benefiting him, but how can this benefit me? You know, love brought it to my attention for a reason. How is this going to help me to become stronger? So, in, inshallah, I mean, like as far as the affection, you know, we have to kind of... It's like a test in, in reality. It's basically a law testing us yes. to see if we're going to allow it to be shared. You know, uh, not just sharing him, but sharing the love. You know, you, you love your husband, but, you know, at the same time, do you really love him? Not just for who he is, but do you love him as far as what he's doing for the hereafter? You know, because it's, he not, he's not just looking out for himself. Sometimes people look at it and the, and the scene, it seems like, you know, he's getting all the great benefits right, and things right. like that. But... Mashallah is like, you know, he's trying to help not only us, but I mean, he's not himself, but also us yes. as far as the first wife, the second wife, and any additional areas. Yes. Thank you. Next question. Um, and I think this is more of, a, if one has any um, scholarly information about mm -hmm. this, you can share that with us. In the event that a brother has more than one wife and he finds that he cannot financially support them now, mm -hmm. what are his next steps? Should he seek divorce with one or both of them? Should he keep them and remain in Salah and hope that the money shall come? <laughs> Strong faith. Okay, what, is it, what are his options if he finds himself in a situation where he has these wives already, but now is a very straining financial time? Yes. Which one would like to take on this one? I, I don't know about scholarly, but, but let us look at um, the truth of marriage. You don't divorce your wife because times are hard. Mm -hmm. So because you have two, why would you divorce them because times are hard, times are hard? I think the same, um, the same kinds of efforts that we have to make, if we have to reduce our expenses to meet our income, then we have to do that. You know, there may be some other accommodations and considerations to make, but we're still a family. And I think that's what one of the most important things about examining polygynous marriage is we are one family. And so because we are a family, then we have to take the steps that are necessary to keep the family together. If it means I have to babysit because there's not enough money for childcare, then we need to trade off how that works, you know, because we want him to be able to survive with us. I want to be married to my husband. You want to be married to our husband. Let's work this out, you know. So I, I don't think you discard your marriage because times are tough. They're going to be tough. That's powerful. You know what? I just want to add one thing to yes. you. That also goes back to the planning in yes. the beginning process. This marriage is beautiful, it's blissful, it's nice, but it's also like running a business. You have to basically plan and kind of seek out, you know, the different responsibilities that's coming with, you know, the sister, if she has children, how are you going to factor that in as far as in, with the income that, you know, everyone is making, if everybody's working or if you're working, and if it's actually going to be feasible. And, and then on top of that, of course, you're going to also, even though we plan, we make intentions, exactly. a law's plans are greater than our intentions. Yes. So let's, let's inshallah, at least make plans for those type of things so that way we can at least kind of be prepared when those particular situations happen and we're not just looking like, uh, oh, what are we going to do? Yes. You know. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. That's the end of the show. We really appreciate Philadelphia for, making, for having a warm welcome for us.
We hope you all are pleased with this, inshallah. If, and lastly, we, inshallah, we hope you please Allah with what we're doing. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, assalamu alaikum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We here in Philly with my man and brother Zachariah. You know, we had to do him real quick. We had a distribution out here of the food goods. You know, I like me little sweets. So we got to come over here and see what we, what we can get from him. And, um, you know, we're going to basically roll with Zachariah. I mean, um, we're going to roll with Rasheed. Roll with me. Rolling with Rasheed, rolling with Rasheed. 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 Follow me on my journey. Let's go. Assalamu alaikum. Like Muslim, brother. How are you, my brother? Oh, Rashid, Allah, Allah, Allah. 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 Alhamdulillah. Welcome to ZNZ, brother. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Pleasure to be here. That's a blessing. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so I see we're here in the warehouse. You know, um, we're going to take a brief tour shortly. Sure. Um, so is it possible we can go to your office and definitely, conduct the interview? Definitely. We sure can. Alhamdulillah. Come on this way. Bro, with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the Dream Records, the inspiration behind hip hop and R&B music. Music meaning mind, mind unified, unified with spirit, spirit in tune, in tune with creation. creation. That's what we're about here, the Dream Records. Records. Dream. For more info, 917-254-1174 or MySpace My forward space. slash the Dream Records. So we're here in your office of Zine D Distribution. Can you give us some kind of background on how this came to be, Zine Z Distribution? Well, Zine Z Distribution uh, <clears throat> actually evolved out of a, a organization uh, that I started with. Uh, when I came back to Philadelphia in uh, 1990, uh, I was um, employed by a distribution uh, uh, or organization uh, by the name of ALM, which was ran by a brother, a uh, very, very prominent brother in the city of Philadelphia by the name of Samir Muhammad. Uh, at that time, he was, uh, it was three brothers, uh, Samir Muhammad, a brother named Rudolph Ali, and a brother named Latif uh, Muhammad. And um, they formed what was called ALM, and I worked with them uh, uh, for about three years uh, until um, my family, me and my wife, uh, 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 opened up this uh, organization here, this distribution system here. Okay. Now, as I walked into the office, I've seen different pictures of you and Emium W.D. Muhammad uh, and the different other people. And is that a result of uh, coming up of to build ZNZ, or did that come from previous knowledge of accompanying them? Well, it, it, it was uh, inclusive, I guess you may say, with uh, our development, um, with uh, the organization that I mentioned, ALM, because, again, it was a very prominent organization led by uh, some very prominent brothers uh, in the city of Philadelphia uh, that, um, uh, that provided, uh, I guess you may say, uh, uh, a voice uh, for the leadership of Imam W.D. Muhammad in the city of Philadelphia. Um, uh, that organization also had in its affiliation uh, Muhammad Ali, who was a partner. Um, we actually, uh, in terms of distribution, that organization was the um, producer of the famous Ali Bean Pie. So, mm -hmm. so um, yeah, so, um, you know, underneath the leadership of Imam Muhammad as well as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, the Bean Pie was a very uh, instrumental um, um, product uh, within within our within our community that allowed uh, us to uh, reap economic benefit. So it, it was probably probably the catalyst of that particular product that allowed a lot of uh, the, uh, the interaction and relationships with uh, brothers, uh, 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 prominent brothers, as well as our leaders from across the country to uh, uh, cross paths. Okay. Now it's funny that you mentioned the. Honor Elijah Muhammad and the Bean Pie because the focus of Rolling with Rashid is to show people that 
we we are not just uh, speaking of the Muslims, we're not just oils and bean pie and things like that. We also do that, and we have evolved to do such much more. Yes. Uh, can you explain to us exactly what you have in distribution so that our audience could know exactly what you have and what you come across? Well, we have a, a wide range of variety of, 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 of products uh, within our um, product mix, but it all started with the bean pie, and it also started with the uh, the whole concept of do for self that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad started uh, with the Nation of Islam uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the early 30s and 50s and uh, 60s. Um, that um, concept was uh, uh, very instrumental in the growth and development of Z and Z. But when you look at the broader aspect of it for the African American community, you you'll see uh, that you know. Um, Distribution was uh, of, of of products to our own community was prevalent during the '60s. We've had we've had we had our own foods uh, food stores. We had our own newspaper. We had our own clothing manufacturing. Uh, we had uh, farms. We had you know uh, transportation systems in place. Uh, there were there were there were a wide range of uh, 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 economic. Um, um, pursuits don't underneath that uh, that legacy of, of of the nation of Islam. So um, we at Z and Z, um, uh, following that 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 legacy, um, um, just uh, began to uh, see how that we how how we could um, um, re-implement that okay. that 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 strategy. Uh, providing uh, the service and products uh, to the uh, the broader African American community as well as the Muslim community uh, uh, nationally. Oh, alhamdulillah. Take the commercial break. We come back. We're gonna be rolling again in the warehouse. Sound like. Yeah, so Salaam Alaikum. Once again, we're wrapping up another commercial segment out here in Philly. Don't forget Barakat's Volume 3 Philly Edition. Uh oh, wow, nah, he ain't here. Oh, subhanAllah, so I keep slowly going to tell me how to do it. No time, last time I see you in You're New York. You're not still upset. What? Upset? You left me in New York, you in Philly now, you asked me if I'm upset. How did you leave me? I, I asked you where you was headed to, you just walked away from the final last, the final last. Alright, that really made me upset. But now, look at the new issues that's bothering me. I, well, how is it that now, like, I, I, like, I want to be by myself, all the sisters want to marry me. Like, like, I'm allowed four, but it's eight of them. Hey, so part of I'm not with that. I, I'm not with that. I wanted to know, and I'm so upset about it. It's not the shooter. Let's speak to the shooter, right? Why are brothers running around stopping me after two months? Because I want to come chill and be cooled out, and they only give me another coupon after coupon about your act, where your job be at, your act, where your pants at, and all of that. So part of I'm not with that. I, Papa Mama said, I leave two things for you. I leave the Quran and I leave my Sunnah. He ain't say all that other stuff, you know what I'm saying? We got these different types of methods and all of that. And then bottom line, he just left the Quran and the Sunnah. So why all these school of thought is causing so much controversy and diversity that is separating the Muslims, that Muslims is killing Muslims? I'm really upset about that. I, and then the media is no help. You know what I mean? They, they're exploiting us like we're about terrorism and, and suicidal and stuff like that. And a lot of you can't take your own life, Aki. More or less take another man's life. Mm. I'm really upset, Aki. Mm. But the bottom line is, if you ever leave me again, brother, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> ah, no, see, you, now you got to go. Taste, not, and one more thing. Uh, one more. Where you going, brother? One more okay. thing. One more the last thing I'm talking about is uh, all said and done is like, why I can't come to Juma, come to Juma and leave, and people got to be outside asking for Sonica? Uh, what's the, uh, what's going with that? that. Slow Laker, bro. Yo, there you go again. I see, you, I see you in Washington, uh, Slow Laker. Here we are in the warehouse, you know, to see what different products we have. So, brothers, take the lead. Again, we're here in uh, the warehouse where all the product is. We have various snack food products, as you can see. We produce a product on our own that's been a novelty. Uh, it's, it's like the evolution of, uh, as I described to you, the homeboy and rat snack potato chips, which I'll show you back here. It's called Burrito. Uh, burrito is a, a for the brothers. A, yeah. For the brothers, right? <laughs> uh, a product that we, myself, as long with my children, Z and Z, Zaki and Zafir, and it, uh, the, the, which the company is named after, we okay. developed this pro pro product on our own. Very. Uh, familiar all across the country. I'm sure you got it in New York. A brother by the name of James Lindsay produced this product. 
and uh, it has Romeo on it, but it highlights all of the different rap artists that you know are, are, are prevalent and in, in, in throughout the urban environment that gives up you know the, the type of uh, uh, the, the, lingu the, the, the language and link okay. lingo that we ourselves you know that mar is marketable. You know right. the whole the whole rap uh, industry is is a multi billion dollar industry. So that we you know we we hope to capitalize on it by way of snack food distribution and by way of branding our own urban flavor to products that we ourselves consume. You hear that Muslim artist? You gotta get your face on there now. It's Islamic showcase, we gonna talk about that later. That's right. Okay, we here on the, on the second floor. What's, what's, I see all the nice little setup, baby. We wanna sit down and eat. What's, what's this part here? Yeah, rolling with Rashid. This is the rolling with Nice Town. This is our solution venue right here. What we do up here is uh, we bring to the community all types of positive uh, uh, entertainment. Uh, as you can see, you know, it seats about 125 people. We got a nice soft color on it. The ambiance is great. You know what I mean? We have all, you know, uh, uh, halal sober um, um, entertainment that gives, you know, brings, you know, uh, a, a motivating experience to 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 the community. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, basically, you know, we do a, 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 a live venues like a, a, a poetry, what we call the vibe. We also have uh, the artist United uh, here that does uh, a program called the um, uh, the Education Seed, which is a, 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 a program that highlights uh, untapped talent that gives you know them an opportunity to uh, uh, express and bring their talent to audiences that you know what I mean for a nominal fee and, and sometimes even for free but also up here in Solutions we also uh, allow this uh, venue to uh, serve uh, the community for small events like uh, uh, small weddings uh, uh, small um, um, bachelor parties sweet 16 parties we have a lot of uh, actually uh, 50 uh, 50 year anniversary uh, parties as well as here. It's nice and okay. small. Yeah, so um, this is the second floor of over top of the distribution center. I mean, this corner is a whole block long, and what we did when we rehabbed this whole facility is that we looked at the components of the building and saw how can we make this facility be of, 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 of some um, um, service to the community uh, that, 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 that we're in. So uh, we created uh, solutions. <laughs> Okay, now we're on the third floor, you know, the last of the last, but they always say save the best for last. So this is the corporate, see, this is where all the important people come, so you important people, so let's roll with it. Yes, sir. Well, yo, Rashid, this is the Mecca Corporate Complex. Up here is where, where we uh, administrate all of our activity. Uh, these suites, which are five, serve as uh, uh, the offices that, that, that administrate uh, the, all of the functions that we do here in, in Nicetown uh, with ZNZ Distributed with Mecca Corporate, which is our profit-making arm for our fiscal management and property management, as well as the Nicetown CDC, which is our community development company. We have our conference room where we uh, want to have meetings for in a conference. Is this ZNZ here? Yeah, that's ZNZ actually right there. That's Zaki and Zafir. I had that painting drawn by a guy by the name of uh, Moart. You know what I mean? Who, uh, I guess he wanted to be like Mozart or whatever, but uh, the brother, you know, painted that for me as well. Come on up, Rashi. You gotta pull on up. You know, this is split level. This is where I really, you know, when I really had to knuckle down and do all the paperwork and get into a zone administratively and corporately. This is how I do it. You know what I'm saying? Okay. You know, Imam Muhammad's here on run. We can't stop now. You know, as you can see, you got Sister Clara Muhammad. You got Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You got Harriet Tubman. You got Marcus Garvey. Uh, you got uh, 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 um, uh, Bethune, and you got Frederick Douglass, you know what I mean? So, you know, that's the legacy, and we cannot stop. You know, we trying to bring back, you know, our, our, our legacy in terms of, a, you know, community empowerment and, uh, you know, raising the upliftment of the African-American people, and when you do it, you have to do it in, 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 in an organized way, in an administrative way, and you got to handle your business. That's right. You know what I mean? Say how you said, you got to roll like the rollers roll. <laughs> and like the E-Man once said, he said, you couldn't st you couldn't stop us before, now we got the second breath of life? Yeah. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. <laughs> you ain't gonna stop us now. You ain't gonna stop us now. So that's what, you know, this this is this, this is my uh, the head my head office and um, that's what we do, you know, uh, in, in Philadelphia, in Nice Town. And our whole uh, goal is to take a 
whole section of the city. And you were out there out in uh, uh, South Philly, and you see what those brothers did out there, brother Kenny Gamble, uh, uh, a.k.a. Abdul, uh, 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 Lufman Abdul Haq, and uh, brother Rocky Islam. They, they've, done, they've done, I'm actually following uh, in their shoes. They, they have uh, taken a whole community and provided housing and, and built a masjid out there. So we're, we're, gonna, we're doing that here in Nice Town. Okay. So that's what we're doing, and we're, you know, we're going to continue to roll. Well, that's what we do here with Rolling Rashid. So we're going to end this segment. And, um, alhamdulillah, thank you for having us. Hey, thank you, Rashid. You know, come on back anytime. Well, we sure will. We'll get right. some of that nice, nice treats. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, you know, this is Barakas Volume 3. See you, Volume 4. Sound like him. Roll with me. Roll with me. Rolling with Rashid. That's Rashid with two E's. Cause there's no I in team. With hardship, there comes ease. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. This is Brother Abdul Malik again with you in another segment of Islamic Inspiration. Yes, we're in Philadelphia, PA, at United Muslim Masjid. We're here to interview resident Imam Naeem Abdullah. So follow us in. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. We like to welcome Barakas to the United Muslim Masjid. We're here located in Philadelphia, South Philadelphia to be exact. My name is Imam Naeem Abdullah, and right here we have... Imam Ahmed Hanna. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I'm originally from Queens, New York myself. And I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I just want to give you uh, a brief history of myself, and I'll let Imam Ahmed do the same. And then we'll try to uh, keep you all up to speed and give you all a little history of the Masjid and what we are trying to do here at the United Muslim Masjid. Uh, my Islam begins actually on Rikers Island in the jails in uh, New York City, C-73 uh, to be exact. I took my Shahada in 1991, uh, late 1991, and I was released, well, alhamdulillah, four years later in 1995. Upon my release, I became an active member of Masjid Taqwa in Brooklyn and later became one of his assistant imams. Well, alhamdulillah, I learned a lot from Imam Siraj, inshallah. Shout out Imam Siraj. Uh, alhamdulillah, uh, I began to uh, learn a lot. I, I ben benefited a lot from Imam Siraj, particularly in the area of Hadith and uh, Nahu, you know, Arabic grammar. I learned a lot from Imam Siraj. And, uh, I don't know where to go from there. Uh, as far as my um, Islamic history, also like Naeem, it began in the, you know, the jails in Rikers Island, New York City, C-74. I took my shahad on the Imam Bilal from Masjid Hamdina. Imam Bilal, you know, I still I got a lot of love for you, brother. Um, after being released in 1999, I remained you know, active in Masjid Muslimin, and then I moved to uh, Philadelphia in uh, around 2001. I became a member of this community, learning under some of the previous imams they had, like Imam Ava Woods, um, Brother um, Ustad Abdullah, Imam Abdul Hamid, where we study, you know, and also Imam Muhammad Sharif from the um, Jamaat of uh, San Cory Institute. And we study, you know, different books on Islamic jurisprudence, Arabic grammar, um, Hadith methodology, and, you know, verbal conjugation and stuff like that. And, you know, being part of this community, basically what I do is I'm one of the teachers for the Quran School for the Children, and I teach some of the adult classes as it pertains to you know, Arabic grammar and um, Islamic jurisprudence. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I was uh, mentioning my uh, uh, beginnings, you know, in Islamic activism, so to speak. And I, I, as I was saying before, I really benefited uh, a lot from Imam Siraj. I initially came to him because I used to travel with him. I initially came to him and asked him for a class on public speaking. But he gave me more than that. He told me something that I still believe and hold to today. He said, I'm going to give you something a little bit more than public speaking classes. He said, I'm going to give you the miftah. Miftah in Arabic means key. And we began to, we began to study some very important points about basic Arabic. 
And so even though I knew how to read Arabic and write Arabic prior to meeting Imam Siraj, but I learned a lot of, of basic fundamentals from him, alhamdulillah. And then after that, I, I also learned from uh, uh, Muhammad Sharif as well, uh, being part of the uh, uh, the Jamaat of Uthman Danfodi, a very famous West African scholar in the Sankori Institute of Islamic African Studies. Uh, Imam Ahmed already mentioned uh, uh, a lot of the things we learned. We, we, and we also learn how to put history in its proper context and how history has has a lot of effect on uh, what goes on with the Muslims today uh, because Allah says in the Quran He says You never find a change in Allah's Sunnah and, and He said also that this is uh, this is a Sunnah of those who came before you never find a change in, in the Sunnah of Allah which means which means those things that happened before are going to happen again. There's, you know, and so we, we benefit a lot from the scholars of the past, and we try to implement, you know, what we learn here, you know, in this community as well. Uh, as far as the history of the United Muslim Master, this Master, what I understand, was established around 12 years ago by a brother by the name of uh, Lukman Abdul Haq and some other brothers, older brothers. He's probably known, you know, around the world as Kenny Gamble from Gamble and Huff Productions. And actually, you know, this was his act, old neighborhood that he grew up in. And he came back and, you know, he established, after becoming Muslim, he established Islam and actually cleaned up this part of, you know, South Philly. We used to have, at the place this master stands, used to be like a hotel where prostitution and all types of stuff used to go on and across the street. It's a whole bunch of, you know, illicit activities. And what happened was when he came, he cleaned the community up build affordable housing. They have a charter school across the street that runs full time from, you know, kindergarten all the way through. And they have, actually have control of some other schools in the, in the neighborhood. And they just continue community, community development. And that's really the uh, whole thing with this masjid. The title itself, the, or the name of the masjid, also helps explain the United Muslim Masjid. This masjid is just established upon, you know, joining together all the different groups of Muslims and have, providing a safe haven for Muslims to come, no matter what your particular belief in Islam or your particular you know, understanding of Islam, that you could just come here and just feel feel safe comfortable, yeah. and comfortable and that you don't have to worry about, you know, this person pestering you about this particular thing that he does different from you. Yeah, uh, subhanAllah. Yeah, uh, I actually first became acquainted with this masjid, again, with Imam Siraj. And we was he was given a lecture in Philadelphia, and uh, I met a brother named Jihad Ahmed. Y'all, I know y'all met him since he's been here. He's like a real important person here. He's well known. He's I, I call him like the Russell Simmons of Islam. You know, he you know he, he keeps a, you know alhamdulillah, he keeps a lot of good connections and contacts with the Muslims all, all over the place. And you know Imam Siraj wasn't uh, any exception. So that's when uh, my relationship with uh, uh, Jihad Ahmed uh, began, and he began to invite me down here, you know, for classes and khutbahs and, and things like that. So my relationship with this masjid actually started maybe like in 1997, 1998, and I eventually ended up moving here. And, you know, when I came here, I just, you know, I didn't have any, you know, uh, ideas or my intention wasn't to become an imam. I just wanted to uh, come here and really solidify my family because I had, you know, bounced around a lot. And I, I really picked Philadelphia because it has a high ratio of Muslims and also another good thing about Philadelphia is that they're not scared to manifest their Islam like you see Islam outwardly boldly when I first uh, was trying to make arrangements to move here I was coming across the Walt Whitman Bridge and the sister that was at the toll plaza was a Muslim sister with Kimar and everything on she wasn't hiding her Islam Islam is like you know a badge of honor here and, and, and uh, I mean, it's a badge of honor any way you look at it. Uh, I mean, it it's even has respect on the streets. You know, we come from New York. We know New York used to be like that. If you was Muslim, you know, alhamdulillah. But here, alhamdulillah, they still they still held on to that. And so, you know, I, I think you know, like all ghettos, all hoods, it has its negative aspects. But as far as growing up Muslim with a Muslim identity, I mean, if you you know from the hood and you live in the hood and then you had to be restricted to picking a hood to live in, I would recommend Philadelphia because you don't have to be ashamed, you know, with your Islam. 
and actually, you know, alhamdulillah, this masjid, you know, it has a, an Amir, Shahid Dewan. He's actually in charge of everything, you know, that goes on. You know, the buck stops with him. He, that's our Amir. And this masjid actually has four imams. Uh, myself and Ahmed uh, being two of them, uh, Khalil Abdullahi and Idris Abdullah, Ab Ab Abdullah as well. And which is unique. Again, it goes back to the title because we're four individuals, four different styles. But we hope, you know, in, in capturing all of that, everybody can benefit. And, and it's not easy. You know, anybody that works with people know it's not easy. But, you know, as long as we stick to the book of Allah, the sunnah of his prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and what the, what the scholars, the mujtahid imams agreed upon, we should have no problems. If there's difference of opinion, then we just leave it alone. As long as it's in Islam, we don't have any problems. So long as we stick to the, uh, those principles, you know, we don't really have, you know, any problems. Would you like to add anything to that? No, that's sad that you just said it all. Yeah, as far as what we're trying to do in the community is, we, we mentioned before, uh, Lukman Abdul Haq, you know, he's really the uh, impetuous. He started uh, a lot of this with a uh, brother, I believe, Kenneth Norudin, about 12 years ago, this match just started. And uh, they're really serious about community development. That's what kind of drew me to make this community my home. Yeah, this, this masjid is dedicated to community development. This is one of the things that attracted me personally to it because I like to see Islam practice in its totality. Not that we just come, pray fast, break fast together, and that's the extent of our relationship. I like a more holistic relationship. I envision Muslims living together in the same neighborhood. And most of us envision that, but out of all of the communities that I've seen, these this community is the one I've seen that has come closest to that. They own, like like uh, Imam Ahmed mentioned, the uh, charter school across the street. Uh, they they own and manage that. There's four other uh, school public schools in the area that uh, Universal Companies, which is connected with uh, United Muslim Masjid, which they manage. They manage three public schools, and I believe a a, a community college. I'm, I'm, I'm I may be wrong about that, but. Uh, they own a lot of houses, universal companies around here. If you drove around South Philadelphia, they're rebuilding the neighborhood. And all of this is being run by the same Muslims who are active in this masjid. And so this is, you know, we're trying to, you know, establish Islam in its totality. We have non-Muslim neighbors, you know. You know, we tolerate each other, you know. They tolerate us calling their don five times a day from the loudspeakers, you know. You know, we tolerate and curb all the illicit activity that goes around here. I Maybe I shouldn't say tolerate, but we... Put, but like the, you know, tell them to go someplace else with that, with that stuff. Well, it's really kind of, you know, it, it's, it's a, this neighborhood, if you know anything about the history of Philadelphia, this neighborhood it was, was, was real bad. It's nothing like uh, the way it used to be. So much so that, you know, they rezoned this area. This area is technically center city now, like downtown, because of the work the Muslims have been doing here. And so... I'm sorry. No, as, as far as like Islamic thing, like saying about you know things like progressive community development, they have in the master, you know, the Jawala Scouts program where the boys come to the master, they learn different, you know, survival skills, Quran and Hadith, you know, how to practice their name. They also have the Ahima Scouts. The sisters have, you know, active like fashion shows and stuff like that. Um, we have a Quran school that runs, you know, after school program that runs every day of the week that Islamic school in. And there's a whole bunch of other social programs for the whole Muslim family to involve themselves in. And not just for, you know, the man to come to the match and pray and leave. It's like a whole community, you know, growing together and just moving on. Yeah, there's classes every day of the week except for Thursday, which is like yeah. Brothers yeah. Night, which, you know, after Salat al Maghrib, you know, we break bread together, we eat, you know. You know that they when they started, <laughs> they they established. Yeah. yeah, they really established that for brothers who wanted to, uh, you know, do the sun, the, the the voluntary, the sunnah mm -hmm. fast of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of fasting Mondays and Thursdays. So you know, if you was fasting on a Thursday, you can come here to break your fast. So that's where that you know tradition uh, came from. Uh, like I've said, there's classes every day of the week, and actually we're building another masjid in another part of South Philly. They call it Across the Tracks. Uh, it's, Point Breeze. Yeah, on Point Breeze Avenue. The masjid is almost completed its construction, uh, maybe a couple of months away from uh, its construction. We haven't uh, really uh, uh, nailed down a date that we're going to officially open with the first Juma and all of that, but the construction should be finished in maybe about two months, three months tops, by early spring. And so, you know, as you can see, this community is capable of building. 
that's one thing that this community does good is build. And alhamdulillah, we try to build buildings and we try to build human beings. Inshallah, you know, we can all benefit from each other. And I believe that's all I have to say. Inshallah. So alhamdulillah, in closing, we like to say, you know, alhamdulillah, we like to thank Barakats for coming and visiting our community. Inshallah, you'll come again. Visit us at our new masjid that's going to be on Point Breeze Avenue. Inshallah, inshallah, we we'll close out with dua. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik nashadu in la ilaha ila anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk wa la asra inna al insana la fi khusra illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawassaw bil haqqi wa tawassaw bis sabr amin name but that was only one tribe who's prop who, who believed in the one God whose proper name is Allah and that was a tribe of Shabazz yeah. they believed in freedom justice and equality yeah. they had plenty of money freedom plenty of money good home friendship in all walks of life they put in practice what they felt in their heart But after a while, they became corrupt. They began to smoke and sell dope and sell each other in the land. A kingdom divided cannot stand. A kingdom divided cannot stand. But after 400 years of blood, sweat, and tears, Allah raised up from among us the man, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, whose teaching was like Susan Rain. Now we have our leader, Imam Warazin Muhammad, whose teaching is like the sun, benefits the wise and the dumb, and the sage. Now about Africa, we cannot trace. Only our soul knows the place. Only our soul knows the place. We know that was our home, but where we were from, we don't know where we used to roam. Where we used to roam. Yeah. Peace. Yeah. Yeah. It goes out to all the fathers for Father's Day. Yeah. Modern day I was 10 when I last heard a beat like this. Me and Pop riding, tapping our feet like this. When they used to kick knowledge in the world was it. But it was too many black kids pumping their fists. Pop used to do the beats and he wrote the song. All his stuff was about right and wrong. My cousin would rap because his skills were strong. But even back then, I was trying to get on. He took me to the studio to learn how to rhyme. He said, you memorize your lines before you pay for the time. People like to hear the things that he had on his mind. If I study him, I knew that one day I would shine. Most black males don't have a dad for real, but I credit my for giving me half my skill. I stay busy climbing my way to the top, but on Father's Day, you know I'm gonna call my pop. Most black males don't have a dad for real, but I credit my for giving me half my skill. I stay busy climbing my way to the top, but on Father's Day, you know I'm gonna call my pop. Most black males don't have a dad for real, but I credit my for giving me half my skill. I stay busy climbing my way to the top, but on Father's Day, you know I'm gonna call my pop. Yeah. Bring that beat in a little something. Yeah, man, this one is for you, huh? All right. 
Yeah, pa, I know I'm holding it down. Uh, Grew the soon, they'll shave the crown. Yes. Nice maneuvers, I'm doing so well. If only you can see me now. Work on your pack and hustle the atlas. Got you a lawyer to make that cash. Yes. This is no stress, this is practice. Stick to seeing how you act this. Stick to the demon script. Hold rope with a female script. Assalamu alaikum. This is Brother Rashid from Righteous Minds Enterprises. Bringing you Barricades. Volume 4. I know y'all every, every DVD you expect the same old thing, same old, the same old. But since I'm bringing you this one, we in Atlanta? Oh no, 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 no. We gonna get you something more. Such as Rolling with Rasheed. We are speeches of a prestigious event. Not only will Rolling with Rasheed be a, a phenomenal magnitude today because we're not just in the office saying we here on the outside. We got not just one businessman, we got count them three businessmen. The Tahir Show. Assalamu alaikum everyone. This is Brother Abdul Malik. Bring you another Islamic inspiration. And in Georgia, here at Atlanta Mass Jed of Al Islam. We're gonna introduce for the first time my favorite Barakat Sports. That's right. Muslims play sports. Okay. Season basketball. Who was here when y'all was only 23 or only 21? Yes, right. Okay. Yes, Hold on. We can't forget we got Upset producer? Yeah, he's like, Man, I'm, I'm, I'm upset. I'm upset. I don't even know what's going on. He's the artist. I got to come to the studio. I got studio time for the brothers. And they, they come in here, they be, they tell me 10 o'clock. Brothers going to show back 1230. Along with the upset I keep. Oh, yeah, we jam pack action pack. So this one, y'all thought volume three was hot. Oh, oh, oh man. Y'all going to need more than popcorn. Get some more butter. Get some more whatever you're going to get. Cause right now, we're going to zoom in to Barracas. Five.